Witness at the Presidential Political Tribunal in Abuja says he was forced to sign presidential election result in APC's favor. Obab Lagos takes on former President Olusha Gorbasa just calling him Nigeria's biggest problem. In international news, Hong Kong leader declares extradition bill dead after relentless protests. And in sports, Nigerian former international Shegun Odegbali says Super Eagles head coach Janet Rua should have been sacked. This is ANN News. I am Lucy Adeyemi. A bombshell was dropped at the presidential election tribunal on Tuesday when a People's Democratic Party PDP witness told the court he was forced to sign a copy of the result of the February presidential election. The witness, Mohamed Tata, also said he was threatened with termination from the end power scheme in which he is a beneficiary if he did not sign the result. Tata said they reported the threat, but uh, nothing was done to those who forced him to sign the result. The court was told that Tata served as a PDP agent in Jigawa State during the presidential election. The People's Democratic Party and its presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar had filed an application with the presidential election tribunal calling into question President Muhammad Buhari's victory in the election. Still on election and litigation matters, the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, Justice Adamu Kafarati, says every pending political case before the court should be concluded by October. The Chief Judge made the call while speaking at an event hosted by the International Human Rights and Anti-Corruption Society in Abuja on Monday. The Chief Judge said his directive during the elections to disallow ex parte orders in political cases was intentional to forestall any hiccups and to absolve the court from blame by political gladiators. Justice Kafarati noted that democracy only thrives where citizens' rights are guaranteed and corruption curbed. He also stressed that the court and the law remain necessary instrument for regulating any democratic society. He then advised judges to use the courts and the constitution to regulate society for the good of children and mankind. He said the judiciary is the hope of all people, common or uncommon. Zamfara State Chapter of the Association of Local Governments of Nigeria says the state government is denying state local governments of the funds the federal government remits to them from the federation account. The group says this is ignoring the presidential order that such funds be sent directly to the council's account. News Agency of Nigeria reports that spokesman of the association in the state and chairman of Marundun local government, Halaji Amhad Ubaka, said at a press conference in Gaso that the state government had totally violated the presidential order. He said that all the council chairmen who were voted under the platform of the All Progressives Congress APC would drag the state government to court for any further attempt to deny them their funds. In reaction, Director General Press Affairs to the State Governor, Elijah Yusuf Idris, said the Argon members were invited to the routine JAC meeting, but they did not honor the invitation. He accused the Council Chairman of ill motives. He advised that the Chairman should join hands with the current government so together they can move the state forward. President Muhammad Buhari is being uh, lauded by the organized private sector for signing on to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement at the African Union Summit in Niamey on Sunday. The OPS says Nigeria had more to gain through access to the larger market throughout the continent. Director General Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry LCCI, Muda Yusuf, commended Buhari for following the recommendations of the Presidential Committee on the Assessment of AFC-FTA. The SCCI Director General said Nigeria's access to African countries with an estimated one and a half billion population and a two trillion dollar economy offers tremendous opportunities for the country's firms. Yusuf said improving trade among African countries notwithstanding the government should ensure safeguard measures are in place to protect vulnerable sectors of the economy. 
The Oba of Lagos, Ruan Akiolu, has pounced on Nigeria's former president, Olusegun Obasanjo, calling him the country's biggest problem. Oba Akiolu said these are the public presentation of battle lines, adventures in journalism and politics, a book by Chief Olusegun Oshoba, an APC chieftain. The event in Lagos was attended by Vice President Yomi Oshibajo, Senate President Ahmed Lawan, House of Reps Deputy Speaker Ibrahim Wase, APC National Leader Bola Tinubu, Governors in the Southwest, Bayelsa State Governors, Sereke Dixon, Diplomats, Traditional Rulers and others. The other said, and I quote, The problem we are having in this country is this, and I will continue to say it, that the number one problem of Nigeria is Sobasajo, end quote. It appears to be a case of political hiring and firing as the Lagos State Emergency Management Agency, Lasema Workers, relieved of their services by the management on Monday, marched in protest on the government house, Alausa. The 33 men, personnel emergency responders who were let go last Tuesday, were hired by the Akiwomi Ambode government to work with the emergency response unit. Lasema's new director general, Dr. Olufemi Oke Osoyi Tolu, appointed by Governor Babajide Sonwoli is accused of removing them from the workforce. They complained that they were fired unceremoniously after undergoing rigorous training and putting their best in the service of the agency. Coming up, African stories. Somalia cuts ties with Guinea, warns against interference, and later, international stories. Hong Kong leader declares extradition bill dead. You are watching ANN. Welcome back. This is ANN News. Now to African stories. Somalia has cut diplomatic ties with Guinea and is warning against meddling in its internal affairs. The decision to sever relations came after Guinea hosted the president of the breakaway Republic of Somaliland. Somalia considers it an autonomous region. In a meeting with foreign envoys, Somali Foreign Minister Hamed Issey Awad called on the international community to respect his country's sovereignty. He says the country maintains a one Somalia policy. Guinea is not the first country to accord the leader of the breakaway region a presidential welcome. The United Arab Emirates has welcomed the Somaliland leader amid frosty relations with Mogadishu. Howard has warned that Somalia will no longer tolerate any violations. Experts advise that the government should resume talks with the autonomous regions instead of waging a diplomatic fight with African countries. Fuel prices have gone up in Egypt as part of government efforts to boost the economy. Although most Egyptians knew way ahead of time, this increase was coming. Its implementation still generates unfavorable reactions. Reporter Yasser Kahim has the details. The government says it's reducing expenditure by cutting subsidies on energy. Experts say it's inevitable to balance the budget and narrow the deficit. A third of the state budget was eaten up by energy subsidies. But starting 2015, the government took the brave decision to gradually reduce the subsidies. In four years, subsidies had dropped by 80%. This year alone, the energy subsidy has gone down by 40% compared to last year. 
Although people were aware since last year that prices of fuel would increase this July, yet it has still caused dissatisfaction in the streets. It's adding more burden on us. The prices of fuel have pushed the price of public transportation up and other commodities too. It is not just transportation. When you go to buy anything now, the prices are higher, and they will tell you this is because the fuel prices have been increased. A new mechanism has also been introduced in the high-end octane 95 grade. It's a committee that revises the fuel price every three months. The mechanism is based on three components, international oil prices, the import costs, and the dollar value as well as expenses. The mechanism will be applied on all fuel grades in the near future. The oil price hikes has an inflationary effect on most products in the market. So the government has implemented a host of social welfare measures to relieve the burden of the low-income earners. The government has raised funds for the Takafol and Karama social program for the poor. There has been a 20% salary increment, a 70% increase in minimum wage, and a 15% raise in pensions. These billions of pounds that cover the wage increases have been saved from the energy subsidies. With these reforms, the government is targeting an economic growth of 6% in 2020, up from 5.2. Officials say the money saved from the energy subsidy cuts will also be used to develop the outdated health and education sectors. For a long while, the world has heard endless reports on the hunger crisis in Yemen. The problem still exists and Yemen has been declared as having the worst, greatest hunger problem. Now the United Nations World Food Program says hunger crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo is serious enough to make it second greatest in the world after Yemen. Reporter Chris Okamrunga has the details. Congolese displaced by ethnic violence adjust to a new life at a camp in Ituri province. Thousands of them fled their homes in Jugu territory after clashes broke out between the Hema and Lendu communities last month. Humanitarian agencies have scaled up their operations to support them. We have more than 300,000 uh, people displaced. Uh, there is, uh, is a mix of uh, intervention in terms of in-kind uh, I mean, uh, donations. So we're talking that we are bringing commodity and food to the people. Also cash, so we give them cash to access product in the market. The ethnic conflict in Ituri province has worsened the DRC's food insecurity. The World Food Programme says millions of people are struggling to get food across the country. DRC represent worldwide the second largest crisis in the world. Uh, we have more than 13 million people that are food insecure. And you also may consider that more of uh, 5.8 children and women are suffering from uh, uh, acute malnutrition in the country. Local authorities say the conflict has claimed 160 lives. An official from President Chisekedi's party says the government is doing all it can to improve the situation. The president uh, took his team up to Ituri. He went to Bunya and to the places in the region to reassure the people that his government is committing to bring about change. What kind of change? Improve the security situation in those places. And to do so, of course, you need to uh, make sure that your own troops are well prepared to do the job. President Chisekedi described the ethnic conflict as attempted genocide and ordered a large-scale operation against the militias. The government hopes the restoration of peace will enable the displaced people to return to their homes to fend for themselves. Hundreds of people displaced by the ethnic conflict have fled to neighboring Uganda. The crisis has occurred as Ituri province struggles to contain the country's worst Ebola outbreak. When we return international news, Carrie Lam declares Hong Kong extradition bill dead after relentless protests. And later sports, Shegun Degbami says Gennard Broad should have been sacked after the Madagascar march.
watching ANN. Welcome back. This is ANN News now to international stories. Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam said on Tuesday the extradition bill that sparked the territory's biggest political crisis in decades was dead. She's also said the government's work on the bill had been a total failure. The bill which would have allowed people in Hong Kong to be sent to mainland China to face trials sparked huge and at times violent street protests and plunged the former British colony into turmoil. In mid-June, Lam responded to huge protests by suspending the bill. At a news conference on Tuesday, she said nobody should worry about or doubt the government's sincerity in killing the bill. She said there is no plan by the government to restart the process in the Legislative Council. She said the bill is dead. Lam's declaration appeared to be a win for opponents of the bill, but it was not immediately clear if it would be enough to satisfy them. Demonstrators have also called for Lam to resign and also for an independent investigation into police actions against protesters. They also want the government to abandon the description of a violent protest on the June the 12th as a riot. Hong Kong was returned to China by Britain in 1997 with the promise of a high degree of autonomy. But in recent years, there has been growing concern about the erosion of those freedoms at the hands of Beijing. Croatia is serious about stopping migrants from using its border at the crossing point on their way to Slo Slovenia and finally Italy. The Italian government has been pushing hard to slow the flow of illegal migrants headed there. Croatia has stepped up patrols along its borders with Slovenia along which it says a fence could be built and that has angered people on both sides. Alhosa Milinkovic reports. Croatian border police are carefully watching any suspicious movements across the border in Bosnia. They are the EU's first line of defense against thousands of migrants trying to illegally cross into Croatia on their way to Slovenia and finally Italy. Their main task is to serve as a visual deterrent to those considering an illegal track across this small section of the border, but they also intervene physically when needed. Last year, we had just over 50 registered illegal border crossings. While just in the first six months of this year, we had 179. So we do have an increase in numbers, but we are acting only as a first line. We are monitoring the territory of Bosnia, and if we see groups of migrants preparing to cross the border, we deploy our officers to that location. At the Maljevac border crossing, Croatia erected this massive border fence to stop migrants intent on forcing their way into the country. Just a few kilometers away on the outskirts of Velika Kladusha is a camp currently housing over 500 migrants. During the winter, when weather closed all the back roads into Croatia, the population peaked at nearly 1,000 all men. For thousands of migrants, this is the farthest point they can reach on their long and tedious journey. Desmond Happy from Cameroon is one of them. He's stranded here for nine months, all the time trying and failing to reach end destination. He doesn't want to stay here as he feels unwelcome. I am not safe because, for example, going into town is like you have a limited time to be in town. The police will come, hey, leave, leave, what are you doing here? Leave, leave. Then going into a cafe to have like something to eat, you are not being accepted. And that's not the only problem Desmond and many others accommodated in this former window factory barracks are facing. There is a high level of violence among migrants of various ethnicities and oftentimes Bosnian authorities can do little to stop it. If a migrant, and there's an, an example, one migrant murdered another migrant, that person did not get convicted because the judge decided that given the fact that he didn't have a passport, he couldn't say whether the person was really person A or not. The question was not that he committed the crime, because the judge confirmed that there was enough evidence to say he committed the crime. With Slovenia and Italy increasing border controls, officials at the International Organization for Migration say they fear the number of migrants stranded in Bosnia will continue to rise, further straining resources and complicating Europe's migrant problem. China is not a stranger to heavy rains and flooding. It has experienced such extreme weather even this year already. Now another heavy flooding has swept across parts of the country. 
A huge bridge connecting to the caves was damaged on Sunday, blocking tourists from visiting. Workers managed to get it repaired and back to operating on Monday morning. As of 8 p.m. on Sunday, the pathway was successfully repaired. Now the vehicles in and out the Magal Grottoes are able to pass through as normal. Meanwhile, as the heavy floods are sweeping across the nation, not every area could breathe a sign of relief. In South China's Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, a huge number of local residents were stuck, roads swamped and infrastructure destroyed due to the severe weather. Firefighters here worked for two hours to transfer around 80 people stuck in a building to a safe place. Jiangxi Province in southeastern China is no exception. Xiangshan Township became an isolated island as water rose all around it, triggering landslides and causing power outages. When I got up at around 6 a.m., I saw the water rising very high within 10 minutes in front and behind my house. A small car was passing by and couldn't move forward. While the severe weather weighs on mines throughout the nation, it's forecast that flooding may continue in many parts of South China. U.S. President Donald Trump says he would not deal with Britain's ambassador to Washington after a leak of confidential memos in which the diplomats described the U.S. president administration as inept. Trump also attacked Britain's outgoing Prime Minister Theresa May, who had said her government had full confidence in Ambassador Kim Darroch. Trump criticized her handling of Brexit and railed against her for disregarding his advice on how to handle Brexit. The spat between the two close allies followed the leak to a British newspaper on Sunday of memos from Darroch to London in which he said Trump's administration was dysfunctional and diplomatically clumsy and inept. Prime Minister May's spokesman said Darroch's opinions did not reflect the view of the government or ministers, but the diplomat had London's backing. He said ambassadors needed to have the confidence to give their frank assess assessments. Mayor is also due to leave office before the end of the month and has previously lash, clashed with Trump over a number of issues from Brexit to the Iran nuclear deal. Still to come, sports. Nigeria's former international Shegun Odegbami has harsh words and a sack recommendation for Super Eagles head coach. Stay with us. watching ANN. Welcome back. This is ANN News in sports. Nigeria's former international Shegun Odegbami says if he were the Nigerian Football Federation president, he would have sacked Super Eagles coach um, Gyanot Rua after the 2 0 Magadaska defeat of his team. During a television interview, Odegbami said Rua was too relaxed when his team was losing. Odegbami faulted Rua's style in selecting members of the team, especially in the Madagascar match. He said Nigerian players, like coaches who are constantly shouting out instructions and taking up issues with referees, not someone like Rua, whom he said was sitting quietly and not saying a word, not helping his players with difficulties. Odegbami said the nature of Nigerians is to be loud and to be compelled and driven to the wall, not to just relax. Meanwhile, on the big tax ahead of the Super Eagles tomorrow, South Africa captain believes his team can pull out a victory against three-time AFCON champions Nigeria on Wednesday in Egypt. Bafana Bafana, the 1996 AFCON winners recorded a shock 1-0 win against host Egypt in their second round game in Cairo on Saturday. Bafana Bafana captain believes that win will energize his side to perform well against the Super Eagles. Well, tomorrow is almost here. And that's CNN News this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, cnnafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CNN Africa TV. I am Lucy Ademi. Have a pleasant evening. <laughs>